Hello and welcome to this special edition of Political Capital on Bloomberg TV India. This is the show where Delhi meets the loud street. I'm Vivek Law. Joining me now is Milind Dura, one of India's finest young politicians, who is also the Union Minister of State for IT and Communications as well as Shipping. Milind is standing for his third Lok Sabha election as a Congress candidate from the Mumbai South constituency. Thanks very much, uh, Milind, for talking to us here on Bloomberg TV India. My first question to you. Thanks for having me. Why are the markets and India Inc. so upset with the government? And I'm asking you this because most of them actually have been voting you personally and your family earlier, your father, to power. So let me ask, start by asking you this. This is in many ways an economy election, but there seems to be the sense of not feel good when it comes to markets and India Inc as far as your party and your government is concerned. What do you have to say to that? Well, firstly, I have to say, uh, Vivek, since you said that your show connects Delhi to uh, Dalal Street, I've been, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be uh, the voice of Dalal Street in Delhi as an MP of South Mumbai where the Bombay Stock Exchange and uh, a large part of the broking community is based. And I've always been uh, a loud and uh, vociferous voice uh, for this community in New Delhi because I believe the markets are very, very important for our economy. Um, having said that, I think it's important that um, the markets and all those who invest in the markets, uh, number one, look at the markets in the long term. Uh, personally, that's how I also invest in the markets, which is you can't have a short-term view on things. And if you look at my government's past performance in, in terms of uh, its decade-long performance starting from 2004 to now, uh, the, we've given... We, we've delivered on some of the highest, the, the highest growth rates in this country. We've radically improved and transformed um, India in terms of per capita income from, I think when we inherited this government, it was about 24,000 rupees and now it's 71,000 rupees. We've fought poverty like no government before us. We've brought poverty, we've, we've uh, reduced poverty by almost 2.2% every year compared to previous government's track record of about 0.7 or 8 percent. In my ministry alone, in the Ministry of Telecommunications and IT, uh, we've provided massive growth to this sector from 7 crore mobile phones to 90 crore mobile phones today. Uh, if you look at the banking sector, for instance, uh, so you know, there have been great achievements in the last 10 years. I do admit that the last quarter of our 10-year tenure um, has been uh, very turbulent. Um, but I also would like to tell people that uh, the future of India looks very bright, regardless of which government comes to power. And in fact, I would go a step further and say that um, the, the, the spin that my principal opposition party, which is the BJP and the NDA, give to the markets, in that they will be able to govern better and that the markets will soar under their leadership, is actually a complete myth. Uh, and I say that with, with uh, great responsibility because people need to understand that India has fundamentally changed in the last decade or so. Uh, before 2005, we didn't have RTI in our country. Uh, before 2005, we didn't have the number of news channels that we have today who've made uh, India far more transparent and have also made the, the rhetoric in our country a bit shrill. Uh, we didn't have social media. We didn't have as many people engaged on social media. And as a result, opinion cycles, uh, the opinion cycle in this country has shrunk not to 24 hours but to a few minutes. So we are the first government in this country that has had to work in this new environment. Uh, it's not been easy, it's been challenging, but we understand that for the long run it's very good for our country. It's very good for deepening and broadening and expanding and opening up our democracy. But I'm convinced that a, a, a opposition party-led government, especially um, under Mr. Modi's uh, uh, leadership, will be very, very difficult for the markets. And in fact, it will be an unsustainable government because ultimately what gives the market growth? It's political stability. And what guarantees political stability in this country is social acceptability. And Mr. Modi doesn't have broad-based social acceptability in this country. And therefore, I'm convinced that the markets can only, if a BJP-led government comes to power, can do well for six months, nine months for the short term, but after that, there are going to be serious repercussions and serious problems. None of the facts and data points that you gave Milinth can be disputed. And the reason that I introduced you as one of the finest young politicians was not just because you introduced the RTI bill, but also because you've been extremely candid and very open. Where do you think then is the disconnect? Because 
you say, your party says, your leadership says, your government says that yes, this is our track record, we've done a lot. But yet, you lose assembly elections and the market soars. Uh, India Inc. is in private rooting for this person that you talked about, and we'll come to that in just a bit. But where do you think things went so wrong? Some of your colleagues in the party, some of your leaders have talked about a communication problem. You use the word turbulence. Can you articulate a bit more on that? Well, I think it's it's fair to say that, as I said, I, I have no, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't uh, deny that uh, the, the last quarter of our tenure, tenure has, has been turbulent. Um, it has been a difficult time, both politically, economically. I think a series of factors happened. Look, uh, let's remember that number one, um, five or seven years ago when the worst financial crisis hit India, uh, hit the world, and um, you know, some of the most developed, strong Western democracies almost got wiped out. Um, India still stood its ground, and India's its, its growth rate fell from about 9% to 6%. Um, we weren't able to communicate perhaps that effectively that look, we were under financial constraints, we were under severe pressure from global factors. Um, I think we weren't able to communicate effectively that we are the first government that is working in this environment where there is an RTI regime in our country. We are the first government working in an environment where there are 24 hour news channels. We are the first government working in an environment where 25 crore people are accessing the internet and using social media and communicating with one another, sharing information, having access to information about the government, uh, passing judgments very quickly with very little information at the, uh, on, available to them. Um, you know, these are challenging times not just for the government of India but for any government in the world. If you look at what's happening in the United States, if you look at what's happening in Europe, if you look at what's happening in the Middle East, um, social media has has provided great opportunities, but it's also provided great challenges to governments. And I think to sum up, we weren't able as a government perhaps to articulately tell peop the people of India that look, these are factors that are new to our government, that are new to our country, uh, that are challenging, but that together we will uh, you know, absorb them into our economy, absorb them into our political economy, into our country, and that we'll grow stronger as a nation. And I think to some of it is fair to say that the last two or three years were difficult in the sense of communicating. And perhaps um, we could have communicated and engaged with people much better than we did in the last few years. Corporate uh, chiefs, most of whom perhaps reside in your constituency have been, and have been voting for you, Milind, would obviously be meeting you and telling you that the biggest concern that India Inc. faced was the fact that project approvals were not coming through. Your government did do some kind of a course correction recently. In the last one year alone, a special group was created. Lacks of crores of projects have been approved since then. Do you believe somewhere that it was too late? And if that could have been done earlier, perhaps the kind of uh, diffidence which India Inc. faces today would not have been there? Well, you know, there's no point uh, reflecting on what we could have done or couldn't have done better. Um, I think what India Inc. needs to understand and every investor needs to understand that things have fundamentally changed in India. Um, India and governance and decision making and I represent two very critical ministries that are very important infrastructure ministries, both the Ministry of Telecommunications and IT and the Ministry of Shipping which also looks at the port sector in our country. Um, things have changed in India. Uh, bureaucrats, politicians, um, as I said, with because it, it's almost tough for us to remember that pre-2005 uh, a law like RTI didn't exist in our country. It's almost difficult for us to imagine that before 2005, just uh, almost a decade ago, um, in Indians didn't have access to decisions that we as ministers and bureaucrats and governments were making. Um, that has opened India up, that has opened government up. It's made government much more transparent. But what happens as a result of that is also someone can misuse that information. Someone can take that information and say, oh, I think this particular politician or bureaucrat took that decision uh, with the wrong intent. And they can you know, say that somebody is corrupt. And ultimately, nobody wants to be called corrupt. Nobody wants to say that my name is tarnished. Nobody wants to say my name is tainted. So what do people do? People say, let's get a committee. Let's institute a committee. Let's say, take time and deliberate on this issue. 
Now, these are, this is a reality of India. This is a recent phenomena in our country. It's not unique to one particular government or one particular party. And I think what India Inc. needs to understand is that regardless of who comes to power in June, that is going to continue. And that is going to continue for some time. I'm not saying whether it will continue for five years, maybe it will continue for two years. Uh, but the next few years in India, any government will take time um, to allow, to digest these things, to understand that government has changed, government has become more open, uh, government has become more transparent, and that as a result, maybe there's a little tax that we're paying in terms of um, uh, you know, slowing down decision making. But no individual and no political party can claim or say that I'm going to ignore these factors and I'm going to ignore that the government is completely open now and there's RTI, 24 hour news channels, there's social media, um, and I'm just going to take decisions um, you know, very quickly. Things take time. I can give you an example of my own Ministry of Shipping. Uh, we took three years um, to create a land policy on how to lease out port land. And at every stage, um, we first consulted port users. We then uh, consulted different ministries in the government of India. We then had a group of secretaries who looked at this and took a final call. And then, of course, it went to the cabinet and the cabinet took the decision. And at every stage, we put that information out before the public, in the public domain, to get their suggestions. Now, that's a reality of governance in India. So, so India Inc. should see it as, uh, it's a recent phenomena in our country, it's because of RT and other things, but the good news it's not, is that it's not going to last for long. It's going to, I think in one to two years or three years, we'll figure out how to govern in India. And after that, people can expect a much faster pace of growth. But no individual can claim that they are going to ignore these factors and just take decisions based on what they feel is right or wrong. We have to work in a democratic process. Milind, most uh, opinion polls are uh, extremely unfavorable to the prospects of your party in these elections. Yet uh, your leader, Rahul Gandhi, has even very recently said uh, that the party is looking at doing even better than the last elections. W what is your own view? Uh, who is going horribly wrong here? My own view is uh, based on my own experience that I can I can tell you from my own experience that uh, this is the third election I am fighting and uh, in 2004 I remember a decade ago when I fought my first election um, Mr. Vajpayee was Prime Minister of India um, every opinion poll suggested that BJP would come back to power we had this India shining campaign um, going around uh, people said Congress doesn't stand a chance to win uh, you know, a month after those opinion polls came out, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh was Prime Minister of India. Uh, similarly, in 2009, um, I remember in my own constituency and at a national level, most of the opinion polls suggested that BJP is going to come to power or an India alliance will come to power and that um, uh, the UPA doesn't stand a chance of being re-elected. Uh, you, you know, again, a few months later, uh, our tally, tally increased from Congress's tally increased from 145 seats in 2004 to 200 plus seats in 2009. So I think ultimately these opinion polls have to be discounted. The opinion polls have been wrong more often than they've been right. And I'm convinced, as I said, that people who are interested in economic growth in our country, who are interested in economic prosperity in our country, uh, both at an investor level and at uh, a job seeker level, uh, people have begun to understand that what you need for economic growth in this country is political stability. And what precedes political stability is social acceptability. And no political party, um, regardless of whether you like an individual who's leading my party or not, regardless of whether you think we could have done better or not in the last two and a half, three years or not, uh, no political party has more social acceptability than we do. And as a result, I'm convinced that India will once again vote for a UPA alliance. What, according to you, Milind, should be the two or three very key agenda points if there were to be a UPA 3? Well, um, I think, you know, there are, there are so many things that we, we started out doing which, um, uh, you know, which are, I think, revolutionary, which are very unique. Um, look at, for example, what we've tried to do with Aadhaar and with the direct benefits transfer uh, mechanism scheme. Uh, we have radically rethought of how should we redirect subsidies. Now, how do we reduce wastage? How do we prevent wastage of taxpayers' money? Um, 
how do we ensure that the beneficiaries get that money, um, get the benefit of that subsidy. Uh, it may not be uh, a, a perfect idea, it may not be a perfect solution, it may have a lot of room for improvement. But I haven't heard a better solution in this country than that. I haven't heard the opposition or anyone else who criticizes many of our schemes providing a better alternative. Um, if you ask me, one of the greatest things that we can do and continue to proliferate in our country, especially in the ministry that I represent, in the Ministry of Communications and IT, uh, we are embarking on a massive infrastructure program uh, where we are connecting 250,000 panchayats in our country uh, to optical, uh, an optical fiber backbone. And um, where the project is already well underway and it's one of the first few infrastructure projects I think in our country where we are putting the horse before the cart and allowing infrastructure to precede development and not the other way around. Um, that is a project which I believe can revolutionize and completely change India, especially rural India. It can provide connectivity, it can ensure the delivery of social services like education, healthcare, provide connectivity to fa of farmers to the market much more effectively and efficiently than anything else before it. Uh, another uh, initiative of my ministry is e-governance. Um, if you look at how Passport Seva Kendra has completely transformed, if you look at how easy it is now for people to file their income tax returns online, that's all part of my ministry's e-governance initiative. And I believe if we want to really fight corruption in our country and we really want to improve transparency, improve governance, um, while I believe that bills like Lokpal and strengthening laws are important, I'm not quite sure whether um, having adding a new set of bureaucrats to oversee an existing set of bureaucrats who are already overseeing another set of bureaucrats uh, is the only solution. I think we need to make government perhaps smaller and definitely much smarter using technology and that's how we're going to reduce corruption. If tomorrow a person has to, a young 18 year old uh, well, has to go to the RTO and get their driver's license and if they have to pass through five or six stages and meet five or six bureaucrats along that way if using an e-governance platform I can reduce that human interface by five people and make them interact with only one person I've reduced the chances of corruption by almost 80 or 90 percent so these are I think revolutionary uh, reforms that I would like um, UPA uh, and frankly any government that's in power uh, to implement post June Melinda, as I mentioned earlier, you were the person who introduced the RTI bill in Parliament. You were quoted in the past as saying when you were arguing about it, introducing it, there were empty benches. You were the one who t tweeted about uh, the ordinance more recently and that triggered off an outrage and eventually that was junked. Do you feel disappointed that uh, despite yourself having been at the forefront of bringing in legislation which will fight corruption, when you go out there, especially as we saw in Delhi, there was this whole high decibel uh, campaign by the Ahmadmi party and the others saying, get rid of this corrupt government. Do you believe, again, on that platform, you and your party have failed to communicate what perhaps you've done? To actually curb corruption? Uh, you know, firstly, I think that um, I think my constituents know uh, my work in the last five or ten years, and uh, and I firmly believe that people will once again re elect me based on uh, the fact that I've always been a people's, I've always represented their voice. Uh, I've never represented the voice of a vested interest, be it a, a builder or anyone else uh, that plagues the city of Mumbai and in general. Uh, I think, you know, coming back to my earlier point that I made. Uh, it's not about whether we communicated effectively or not. Um, it's really about the discourse in our country today. When we look at the issue of corruption and transparency, as I said, how, what is the debate uh, on corruption today in our country? Uh, the debate is you were for the Lokpal bill and person B was against the Lokpal bill or a variation of the Lokpal bill. Um, if you ask somebody you know what is the Lokpal bill about a lot of people may just say I don't even know what it's about but it's it's just become fashionable to say I think the Lokpal is going to end corruption and I think the way we're debating these issues um, it, it's not the right way to do it and and the problem I have with some of the parties who are simply agitating but are unable to administer so there's some parties in this country who get you know 
100 on 100 for the agitational skills, but unfortunately 0 on 100 for the administration skills. And that's because it's very easy to say that this is the problem in the country. It's very difficult to get into the details of what the solution entails and how do we create political consensus on that solution. And that's why when I spoke to you earlier about fighting corruption, I believe while laws are important and I believe the Lokpal is an important bill and an important law, but at the same time I'm not so convinced whether more bureaucrats are going to reduce corruption. I'm not so sure if bigger government is the answer to reducing corruption. I'd like to, I, I believe as a young person that smaller, smarter government using technology, uh, using e-governance platforms is the answer to reducing corruption. Unfortunately, what's frustrating is that we're not even debating that in our country today. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a tutu me me or it's you're for this or you're against this. Uh, and it's a lot of rhetoric that's um, dominating you know, the, the, the landscape in terms of the debate on corruption and that worries me as a young person going forward. My final question, Melinda, to your electorate in South Mumbai, what would you tell them if you were voted again for the third time in a row? What would be the one or two key issues that you would be focusing your energies on? Well, I think, you know, one of the, the, the issues I'm really proud of, um, um, having pushed through and worked with the state government in the last few years, um, is, to, is that Maharashtra is the first state in the country that has a housing regulator and um, I'll tell you why this is important someone like you who raises so much awareness about um, you know consumer rights and those kind of issues uh, cities like Mumbai and every city in India for that matter uh, if you saw what happened with Kampa Kola sometimes back uh, it's it's every person's dream to own a home it's every person's dream to buy a home um, I'm not saying that the entire builder community and real estate community are, are bad people but they have a pretty large share of bad apples in their community and and I think for a long time they've gone away unregulated and I'm very proud to, to tell the people of South Mumbai and of Mumbai and of India uh, and of Maharashtra that um, Maharashtra today is the first state that has a housing regulator and that we will prevent any camp, future campakolas from happening so today people can have the confidence that the, the chances of a builder being errant of trying to dupe them um, are almost zero um, another thing that I am very passionate about is having a regulatory bill of this kind which is pending before parliament, the real estate um, regulation and development bill across the country. That's something I will fight for. That's something I'll fight for to ensure that not just the people of Mumbai um, have this benefit but the people of Delhi, the people of Bangalore, the people of Chennai, the people of Kolkata have this advantage and many small tier 2 and tier 3 cities also. Um, I think at an infrastructure level in Mumbai city what is very very critical and um, something that I want to work towards is ensuring that we have the Trans Harbour Sea Link implemented in the city of Mumbai and Maharashtra. Unfortunately, I've been trying and I, my efforts have been relentless in getting this through, but for um, various reasons, primarily due to economic viability, this project hasn't taken off. How do we find the right solutions? How do we put you know, the, the best minds in Mumbai city together to ensure this project happens? That is something which is very much on my agenda. It always has been. Uh, because I believe this is a project which if we connect Mumbai city to the hinterland uh, can fundamentally change Mumbai's future for the better. It will free up a large tract of land, it will bring down the cost of housing, make housing more affordable, um, it will make Mumbai slum free, it will allow for more land to be available for key utilities, infrastructure projects. So these are the two things that I would like to tell the people of South Mumbai and Mumbai that I am committed to ensuring in the next, my next term. Melinda, you've been as candid as always. Thank you very much for joining us. I wish you all the very best in your campaign and in the elections. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Thanks for having me.